Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition Online Bible Study for September 16th, 2015. My name is Tony Samario. We had a discussion for several weeks on life after death, which in which much of this argument was brought up, even if it was in a, a more protracted way. There was still a, a lot of things that were talked about in that discussion. And, and more of the evidence than I want to have to re go into again about the reality that Shoel, Hades, these are the words that were used in the Bible for the grave, for death, for the destruction of the body. All these things that Christians have threatened for years, you know, believe in Jesus or go to hell. Almost every single time that word's used, and in almost all those references that Christians make, they're really threatening the same thing that everybody is destined for, which is this afterlife for the soul, of which there are many abodes. And even in, I found in the expression of heaven, uh, there are likewise exist in the expression itself the context of many abodes. And so the, the hell that is the eternal fire, which we haven't even really gotten to, I'm going to put that off for maybe next week. I want, to, I want to just keep on this idea that heaven and hell are things that the Christian church has never really understood in my lifetime. And maybe it's been many hundreds of years and even a thousand years that, that it's been little understood. Uh, only a few real seekers and can imagine in the days when, when if their opinions as mine are today were so against the mainstream of the church you know I, I wouldn't be able to keep talking like this without getting burned at the stake or somehow excommunicated lose my audience you know we come from a long history of misunderstanding these terms and misunderstanding what, what seems to me the more i study that we misunderstand almost all of it. You know, we've, we've sort of grasped the idea that Jesus was the, the sacrifice. He paid that price. Okay, we got that. But what we do about it, how we react to that, seems to be almost entirely the opposite, right? And again, is it just an accident that that parallels the Mosaic idea? I mean, you know, the law was given to them by God through Moses on the mountain. You know, he came down so glowing that he had to put a, a veil over him. You know, the people were just, you know, they knew. They'd seen the water come out of the rock. They'd seen the pillar of fire. They saw the river swallow up the, the army of Pharaoh. And yet still, what, because they were lesser people than us? You know, I would suggest they may have been a darn sight tougher than us. Certainly more in tune with the natural order of things, the stars and the moon and the times and the seasons for growing, for reaping, for animals, you know, all of that stuff. They certainly, the least of them, the children of 10 years old would, would probably know so much more than the average Western person that might be listening to me would understand about the natural workings of things. So these weren't some sort of savages. These were people who have been misunderstanding for a long time this heaven and hell that's been handed to them from the religious authority and then never really allowed to be debated like like I'm debating it. Yes, it has been over the last, you know, hundred years, let's say, a couple of hundred years, the freedom and all that, but you no know, one has debated because it, it was already buried long before that. You know, it's only debated among the people that aren't taken seriously. And so... Uh, so they debate, you know, who, how quickly are you going to hell? You know, is, 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 do, you, do you know anything in the grave or do you just, are you just waiting there to be raised, to be thrown into hell? You know, that's what many Christians, the way I understand their understanding, is they imagine when you die, you're just in the grave. There's no afterlife of your soul. Your soul is in the grave knowing nothing until it's raised from there at the last judgment to be thrown in the lake of fire. That's their conception. And, you know, I, so I'm always reading the scriptures trying to, you know, to find, to, to verify that or not. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really, I know, you know, since I grew up in that, I originally read the scriptures expecting that's what I'd find and accepting in many cases that the few 
suggestions of it turned into a doctrine somehow um, must be true because everybody's saying it. Even though in my heart I, I seem to know it can't really be true. It just it doesn't. You can't tell me God is love. I mean, look at George Carlin's joke that he's had all those years. You know, that's the way the world sees it. It's a big con. You're telling people that there's a God in heaven that really cares about everything you do and he's watching you and he's going to punish you and he's going to send you to hell. You know, everybody, but the, the ones who love Jesus. But he loves you. You know, he loves the world. So it's a, you know, that whole story it really is hard to undermine in all of us. It is the story. It's like looking at our government and thinking in all those fancy rooms, in all those fancy suits, in all those fancy cars, and, you know, the way that they run about, you'd think, you know, the average person wouldn't have access to that unless they were really doing something important and really being of value to someone. And so we imagine, because it looks that way, that that perhaps these people really do know what they're doing or they really are taking care of business. I mean, you know, it's pretty clear these days that most of them are, are quite feeble-minded, you know, when it comes right down to it. There are a bunch of lawyers who know how to steal. They know how to keep their own butts out of jail and double talk, double speak, legalese. You know, they, all, they know all these, these worthless values that are, when you read Scripture, if you believe what's in the Scripture, you know, these are the truly evil things. Using your position to, you know, gain something without providing something. To find a way, no matter how good you look, to take from others without giving to others. You know, that's hypocrisy. That's what we found out, to, well, for me anyway, when Jesus uses the word. You hypocrites, how are you guys going to stay out of that that wasteland, that that valley of Hinnom where we throw all the trash? How are you going to stay out of there? Because you got to fear the one that can throw your soul there no matter what you think you look like, no matter who you're pleasing in the world. There's someone that can throw you there. So what we talked about is, okay, so where's the evidence? Who's going there? Well... Nobody. I mean, I don't know. Anyone who doesn't cut off their eye or hand or foot. But aren't we all offended by these things at one point or another? Do any of us cut them out? And so a Christian wants to scream, well, that's why you've got to be covered by the blood of Jesus or you're going into the hell. Okay, well, now here's the inference where we get closest to any argument that might be made. But you can't just... You, you have to take all of Scripture. You can't just take one inference that can be drawn. You have to see if that balances with the rest of Scripture. You know, where are all these places then that Abraham is and that the rich man is? And why isn't he condemned to this eternal fire but only to this region of the grave? Hades, Gehenna, I mean, uh, Shoel. Not Gehenna. Not the, the valley of Hinnom. That's not where we find him. That's not even where Samuel tells Saul he's going to be. He says, you and your sons are going to be here with me today or tomorrow, right? You're coming here looking for how's it going to go in this battle. I told you when I was alive, you're done. And so now, you know, I'll tell you straight, you and your sons are going to be here with me. Again, you're not, you're going to be in the Valley of Hinnom. That's where you're going. See, there's none of that. So we have to infer that. We have to infer that this God of love is not only going to send you to some place that appears to be a place of punishment for your soul in the afterlife for perhaps thousands of years. You're right. They've been waiting on Jesus for how long now? Certainly hundreds and hundreds of years. We know from the, from the Scripture that the rest of the dead don't get their bodies back till the thousand years was ended, Revelation says, right? The rest of the dead. Who are they? You know, and, and, and so anyway, they're at least a thousand, you know, they're in the grave a thousand years. So, um, you know, you have to, I don't know, you, you have to qu face this question as a student of scripture and of eschatology. And um, w what's the reality here? Is God talking about blanking everybody out except Christians? 
How come Samuel's still there, right? How come Saul's going there? How come the, the guy on the cross next to Jesus is going to paradise with him today? You know, what, what sort of repentance has he gone through? Remember me when you get to your kingdom? That's someone who's repented of whatever sins brought him execution? I believe in you, Jesus. You're the Savior of my soul, Jesus. He simply said, remember me when you get to your kingdom. Right? And that earned him paradise, which, you know, we haven't gone into that word yet. I haven't. I'm, I'm still trying to take it slow. I want to I want to lay a foundation that when we all talk about this in our Bible study, you know, these are we're, we're referring to the words in their in their, you know, authoritative meaning. This is what they actually mean. Wherever that leads us, if it leads us to a God that's throwing everybody into hell and giving only a few people heaven, okay, let's accept that, but let's see if that's what it really says. And so last week we found that all the places that in, in my life I've listened to preachers talk about, you know, the soul going to hell and then being that being uh, inferred to be this lake of fire at the last judgment. And so that now you've got this nice clean, you're going to die, you're in the grave, then you're raised and thrown into the lake of fire. That's what that all means. But when we looked at it last week, we seem to find that it means something else. It, it, it specifically means that when you die, you are subject to this place of the souls. That everybody, for sin comes death and all have sinned. So, it would seem that the real Christian offer is it saves you from that uh, predicament that you will pay for your sins in Hades, not in the Valley of Hinnom, right? That's something else now. That's reserved for wickedness. So, see, Christians automatically, oh, if you don't praise Jesus, are you wicked? Well, I mean, the guy on the cross. Hey, remember me, guy, when you get to your kingdom, you know, you're claiming this heavenly kingdom and all. Hey, remember me. You know, are we going to have to go so far as to claim that he was a righteous man, wrongly executed? Is there any, do, do any of our books confirm that, that that's why the Lord let him in? No, there's nothing about that. And there's nothing about condemning the other guy to hell for saying, ah, this guy I heard about you why what are you hanging on the cross for right there's nothing that says okay well you'll see you're gonna burn in hell forever and this guy's coming to paradise you know if that really is what's happening that's so important that why isn't Jesus and every one of them you know I mean that should you know that would have to be your your anchor in every presentation in the way that I use this sort of anchor that okay it doesn't really say believe in jesus or go to hell i mean i have to keep saying that in every every time i speak because it's that important a message against the backdrop right of a world that in christian world that that is known for saying just that and and when i go to the internet and when i look for you know answers to you know who's the antichrist and what's going on it's all these Christian sites that are all with that same message. Because the Antichrist is coming, you better get this is your you know this is your warning. This is your last chance. Better get right with Jesus, or you're going to hell. And now this is the Jesus everybody's rejected because of that vision. And and we don't have the the depth as a, a church to look at ourselves and and look at the reality of how people feel about the church. To say, geez, I, I mean, this has been my predicament all along. I, I know how you, I get it. I get how you feel. Like, I don't like the church much either. Except that they're the ones that are saying Jesus died. He died. It's his blood. See? So, oh, wait a minute. You can't throw them out completely, can you? They are the ones saying his blood. Um, the problem is I see the whole Laodicean church concept that gets clearer and clearer to me the more I, I, I uh, consider this. That, yeah, that's why Jesus can't condemn them. He spits them out of his mouth because, damn, you're, you're saying me. You know it's my blood and yet you don't act like it. You don't act like the early church. 
you don't act like your number one concern is my number one concern. Right? You got all these worldly concerns. You're using my name and the concept of my sacrifice. So yes, you've got that. You, you haven't forgotten that. But at the same time, you, you don't live, you don't do what I asked you to do. The world doesn't get to see me or the Father. They, in fact, get to see a confusion. They get to see a bunch of people that use my name, but not my way. And, and I see this as the real crux of the way the Christians finally get to learn their lesson. How the Jews get to learn their lesson through electing a false Messiah. And the Christians get to learn their lesson by realizing that for the most part, they've all, you know, missed this rapture they're waiting for. They're waiting at the wrong time. They're waiting on the wrong things. They're just waiting to be saved because they're better than everybody else for knowing Jesus. When the scripture seems to show that the people that know Jesus show it to everybody else. You don't have a light and put it under a bowl, Jesus taught them. What use is that? If you have a candle, you put it out in the room so it can be a benefit. People can see with it. So if you're that light, what are you doing hiding under a bowl of the, the you know, popular way of life, the, the, the worldly view? so that you can't be seen as anything different. See, what we found when we studied the Gospel of John was that what Jesus said in His final prayer is, I not only pray for these guys, but the people that might hear their message that they would believe and what? Be in one unity in the Father. And we know already how that is. Jesus said, if you see Me, you've seen the Father. He told those disciples quite clearly, here's the command I give you. A new command. Love each other the way I've loved you. Don't just love your neighbor in the Old T Testament sense that you're not to look on yourself with superiority and primacy. You're to look on your neighbor as equal with you, requiring everything you require, and it being your responsibility to make sure you uphold your end of that so that if everyone does that, you do have God living among you. See, but we don't do that. And so we have everything from, from misunderstanding and darkness all the way to wickedness. And I see that th there's a real difference. And I think in this study of heaven and hell, you know, these are the sort of words and stuff I want to get into. What is darkness? What is wickedness? You know, th these seem to be how God separates um, his relationship with people. And, and so the Christians, you know, I see more and more, the opportunity is to follow him. And if you do that, boy, death, Hades, Shoel, you won't taste what everybody else tastes in that. And the second death, the one that some have to fear, the ones who refuse to fear the one that can destroy your soul, the ones that willingly do evil, Right? You won't ever have to, you know, that has no hold on you whatsoever. The second death is something you'll never see. So, you know, here's the reward for this small group of outcalled ones that will follow him even, even unto death, even unto doing what he asked us to do. Love your neighbor. And then not only that, if you want to be a disciple, you want to be part of that group. Love each other the way I've loved you. How did he do it? You know, he got on his knees and washed their feet. The master got on his knees and washed the servant's feet. And that's the conclusion he drew for them. See, here's how I, so don't, so all you're worrying about being first, who's getting the most blessings. That's why, I, you know, I've been against that in the church for the longest time. This, you know, gospel of prosperity. You don't find it in the gospels. Right? The prosperity is an inner prosperity. It's one of, you know, I, I've been reading a book again about St. Francis of Assisi. And the G.K. Chesterton version apparently is, you know, one of the finest. It's kind of short and sweet, but very enlightening, very deep. And the idea that you see is here's a person, you know, that perhaps for the first recorded time in history, you know, actually took God seriously on that count. That a servant was the happiest. That to be a servant 
was the closest to God. And 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 that's why St. Francis became someone who's, you know, still world famous after 750 years. You know, because here's a guy that really took it seriously and went out into the world as an absolute servant. You he he wouldn't let anybody outserve him. And you know, these are the that's why these are the you know, the old fashioned saints in the sense of the Catholic saints, you know, the people of reverence that you want to try and emulate. You know, and in that sense, you know, what's wrong with a saint? It's just another word for a, a hero. It's a religious hero. And in that sense, you know, Saint Francis, regardless of the fact that scripture doesn't call for anybody to be sainted, there's the saints in scripture are the are, are simply the ones sainted to God. They're the ones that God owns. So the Catholics turn that into this weird hierarchy of people. Uh, but I just tend to look at them as heroes for, for many of the things they did. And what they did was to live that life of selflessness. And so St. Francis happens to be one of those that embody it stronger than any human has ever come to embody it again. And so that's the sort of Christianity that would change the world. If you had millions of St. Francis's running around, you know, don't tell me that wouldn't, I mean, that would change the world, period. And so we didn't do it. And yet that's what we were asked to do. We believers, we were asked to be in this unity and act like him, follow them in this path of, of taking care of our neighbors, taking care of each other, not seeking our own gain as the first thing in our life. And so, you know, how hard is that? It's proven by the world we live in and the world that's called Christian. And so, anyway, that's a little bit of a sidebar. Just for me, it's the result. It's the result of all this misunderstanding. So perhaps if we could just start unraveling that one, you know, my, like, like my dad used to say about the end times, you know, illuminating the world one candle at a time. That's all you can do. You can shine your own light don't hide it under a bowl, you know, put it out for people to, to, not to see in the sense of, oh, look at your light. That's not the point. So they can see to walk in the dark, you know, and you do that by not looking at the candle itself. You're, you're looking at the light that the candle casts in the darkness. And, and, you know, that's really what any Christian or even illuminated person you know, there's a lot of illuminated people that aren't Christians. For a Christian to deny that is is really silly. Paul makes mention in Romans of the people that are a, a law unto themselves, that not having the law nevertheless do the things the law calls for. These people are a law unto themselves. Do, why do they have to know Jesus? Right? They're living the law that the Jews won't live. They're a law unto themselves. Suppose they grow up in China or somewhere else. What makes you think if they don't know Jesus, they're going to go to this Valley of Hinnom where all the waste is burned forever? No, oh, it's much more likely, isn't it? Scripture is much more evident, in my, in my view, that it's much more likely that there are many places in the afterlife to contain the different ways in which we sin so that our sins might be atoned for in that way, as well as the blood of Jesus, which atones for so few, which gains them this, this preeminent position, which I'm going to go ahead and predict is a preeminent position of servitude, not superiority, like many of the Christians I grew up with imagine. They're going to be kings and priests they're going to rule with an iron scepter they're going to well no it's the jews that are promised a kingdom it's the jews that have the iron scepter which is the law which is simply that law of love now they're the ones that will never disobey that law of love but now these people that follow jesus his flock that comes back with him uh, you know what could they be but people like the disciples that were first with him that have their sight set on something other than their own their own desire worship, their own ego gratification. I mean, oh, come on. They've got to be the ones that come back in that constant service of love 
in the image of the Father, in the image of Jesus. That, you know, I think it's going to surprise a lot. That's why so many disciples fell away, as we saw in John, when he told them about the hard teaching of, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you got, you never, you're not going to live forever. You know, you're going to die. And they said, well, wait a minute. What do you mean eat your flesh and drink your blood? I'm telling you, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, yeah, you don't do it. You know, and so how did they respond? Oh, we get it. Yeah, it's symbol. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, no problem. Give me, I'll eat your flesh. I'll drink your blood right now. Let me go say a prayer like a Christian who understands everything so easily. It's all so easy for them. But to these people, it wasn't easy. And in fact, many of his disciples, it said, turned away at this. Because following that, when they said, well, wait a minute, this is a hard teaching. Who, who can understand this? And he said, I'm telling you. Many of you don't believe, right? You're following me because you see miracles. But you, do you believe I'm the Messiah? I really came from God. I'm the one. No, I'm a freak to you. I'm a freak show. Many of you don't believe. I tell you, if the, God, if, if the Father's not drawing you to me, you're never going to see me. Again, who do you say that to? Christians? No. No. Paul went and reiterated because Paul saw this this story's crazy. The Jews are never going to believe he's the Messiah because he died. Messiah can't die. They don't see that in the scripture. There's no dead Messiah. The Messiah comes and you know rules forever. So that we killed him. He's dead. He can't be the Messiah. So it's a stumbling block to Jews and the, the idea that this God came back to life and in his earthly body and that's, you know, that that's the story resurrection of your earthly body into your earthly you know well that's foolishness to gentiles even on a, a physics level wait a minute where's all the molecules that we share going to come from my body's made of of molecules that used to be other things maybe other people how are you going to get those same molecules back after they've been scattered for millions of years or thousands of years or whatever it's been right we're made of the dust of the earth, and the dust of the earth is made of other dead stuff. So, you know, all these sort of things were brought up even in the day of the, the Greeks facing this, this question. And that's why Paul saw it's foolishness to the Greeks, what, what I'm saying. So unless God brings you to this, you're not just... This isn't a story for the smart people to go, Aha! And it isn't a story for the people who were supposed to know to go, oh, okay, I get it. I mean, that's what Paul saw. So how else? Who's going who's gonna to get it? And God's going to have to reveal it to you. God's going to have to call you to this. So where does it say, and everybody else he's going to throw in that Valley of Hinnon? It doesn't say that, see? It doesn't say that. It says everybody else is going to see that grave. See, and so Christians infer that then they're going to be raised from that grave to go to hell because Christians are all going to heaven. But wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Let's get into heaven for a minute. Um, again, I, you know, I'm encouraging everybody. This Blue Letter Bible is terrific, so I'm just going to use it today. It's a, it seems a, for these kind of things where we're not going to read through a particular uh, book, it seems very, you know, to scan over things, it's, it seems quite relevant to use it so there's you know there's almost 600 uses of the word heaven in the king james version of the bible so be hard to go through all of them so i saw i, I decided let's start with revelation to see what we get uh in the book of revelation for the word heaven and so when you search it that way, because you can search it by book, it's really interesting. So I've got all these. So it, it comes, it occurs 56 times in 54 verses. Okay. So starts in Revelation 3.12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out and uh, no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 4.1, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it were a trumpet. 
Revelation 4, 2, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven. Okay, so I thought, well, this is a good one. You know, the first one might be considered the sky, right? I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, but um, this last one can't be. So first of all, let's, let's look at how many heavens are there. We find out there's nine, nine times this word heaven. There's nine different words that we know as the word heaven. Four of them are in the Old Testament as the Hebraic, Hebrew or Aramaic words. And five of them are in the New Testament as the Greek words that we use for heaven. Now, just, I mean, to try and not spend so much time, as I say, anyone can go research this. It's quite interesting. But you find in the Old Testament that all four words, Galgal, Shakak, <laughs> Shamayim and Shamayin all refer for the most part as the heavens as the sky. And it shows you why there were so many ancient religions that believed in different planets that were gods and etc. Because the words that even Moses used didn't refer to some dimensional heaven. It referred to the expanse of the heavens above the earth, at the, at the extreme of the earth, is what much of these things mean. I, I want to get into the New Testament versions, but let's just take uh, this last one here. They're bit, you'll see, the, you'll, this is, well, let's just go through the exercise with each other. The final heaven spoken of, of the four Hebrew ones, because Galgal, English equivalent. This is this is the way they show it. If you don't have a computer right now, you got your Strong's number, which is the number the Hebrews use. Because remember, all the in the Hebraic tradition, numbers and letters are the same thing, and so every Hebrew word is also a number, and so those have been turned into a code, so that all the Bible words that have been used also have numbers. And um, so the Hebraic ones, Strong's num gives them all a number. And these aren't the Hebraic numbering system, but this is Strong's numbering system so that every word can be referred to by number so that it can be searched as its own number rather than something that uh, looks similar in letters, okay? So we're talking about here number 8065, uh, Shaima Yin for heaven. 8064 is Shama Yim with an N, Y I M rather than Y I N. And the English equivalent for 8064, Shama Yim, is Heaven Air Astrologers. 8065, Shama Yin, it just says Heaven, the English equivalent. So what does that mean? I don't know. So let's click on this number, 8065, and it takes you now to what we were reading last year about hell. Okay, you see the the um, the times, the translation count, 38 times this word, shamayim, yin, with an N. It's an, you find out it's a Aramaic, Aramaic word. It corresponds in its etymology, the root of the word corresponds to the one we just read before, shamayim. So we're looking at essentially these same two words come from each other. Uh, outline of biblical usage is our next line here in, in, in the way this blue letter Bible works. And so um, one, heaven, heaven, sky with the breakdown of A, visible sky, or B, heaven as abode of God. So again, we're not to a dimensional heaven as abode of God. This is what I'm trying to, you know, I'm going through a little extra effort here because I want this to sink in so we can run through more of the examples either this week or next week or in our, in our ongoing talks. And we all know what we're talking about. I don't have to bring this up every week. Um, so far, what we've seen is that even in the Aramaic, heaven is, has something to do with the sky as the abode of God, right? The Not necessarily the blue sky that we see where clouds are, but the expanse that goes out from the earth beyond the sky 
into the expanse, right? That, that's the heavens. Same place the stars are located, right? And, and this is perhaps where the confusion came from that prompted the first Russian astronaut to say, you know, we've proved there's no God. We, you know, we've been up there. We didn't see him. <laughs> because this is where the word really comes from. You get, get out of the earth's atmosphere, you're up in the, in the heaven. Where's God? Where's his throne? Where's his palace? See? So we're going to get now to the New Testament, how we've, how we have come to see that in a different light. But I want to point out that the etymology of it, you know, where this stuff comes from, the root of this stuff, is not in some dimensional heaven where God lives with angels, at least not so far as we're learning in the Old Testament version. Okay, now the other two versions, number H1534, Galgal, -gal, the English equivalent is wheel, rolling thing whirlwind okay so that's not a third dimensional place of abode of god and then h7834 the word shak yak shaka ak i probably horribly mispronouncing this looks like shak ak means cloud sky small dust right a dust storm is going on in that heaven right Particles fall from the heaven of that heaven. So this is also not a deeper heaven, but a, a more earthly look at it. So these are the four words in the Old Testament for heaven. So don't tell me anywhere you're talking about heaven in your whole Old Testament. God's referring to some dimensional place that Christians come to talk about. He's, he's not. He is, yes, in the word 8065, which occurs... 38 times, and in this blue letter Bible like this, you I mean here they are, here's the list. Ezra, and thus they returned us answer saying, we are the servants of God of heaven, of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house that was builded these many years ago. Okay, this is Ezra. We are the God of heaven. And so identifying again with this God that is from the beyond, but not a beyond that relates to an eternal otherness outside of what we would call you know the heavens where the planets and the sky okay space this is the space man god essentially and you can read through all these verses it the god of heaven all of these verses primarily refer to daniel then was the secret revealed unto daniel in a night vi vision then daniel blessed the god of heaven all right now christians always refer you know, I always thought of this as the God of this heaven in his third dimension. And perhaps there's a parallel there that Christians are capable of drawing now that we have these inferences from our New Testament. But I, that's why I want to get into heaven a little bit more now. In the New Testament, what are we talking about with this God of heaven? What is this heaven? See, is it this place that we're going to? As opposed to hell being this refuse pile that some things will finally be forever disposed of in is heaven a place that we will finally be disposed to be in heaven okay and i'm going to go ahead and you know shock christians in case i don't get to the full answer maybe keep you coming back uh i'm fine to no. know <laughs> no you don't go to heaven and heaven doesn't come here Oh my gosh, how can I say that? Okay, well good. If you're if I haven't got you bored and you're still interested, then let's now study how can I say that? What do I what do I mean by that? Uh so let's go back to where we were in Revelation then. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Well, if this ain't the place Right? Okay, so where is this heaven? What is this word? So we click on it. It brings us to where it occurs in Scripture. We click on it again, and it brings up that any verse of this that we want. It's exact breakdown, every word, and gives us the, the number, the root form of the word. Okay? So very interesting. You can go to any of these words in the sentence, and immediately, I was in 
the Spirit, pneuma. That's the word for the Spirit here, because, of course, there's many words for spirits. Another one we can, you know, in this little this um, series that we're going to get into right now, I'm enjoying it, unless anyone's got something else they want to study. You know, we've, we've been through Romans. It's not on our YouTube channel, but I believe... It's in our archives, and we and if you write to us, we can find that. But you got Revelation, First and Second Corinthians, the Gospel of John. You know, we've done a whole thing on life after death, trying to extract from the scriptures. So, unless someone's got something really specific they want to uh, go through, a, a particular uh, book of the Bible, and you know, for my money, that you know, things like Job are very interesting. All these ones we don't understand. Hebrews is one of my favorites. But for now, I'm really enjoying picking out certain words and and coming at it from that end. Because, of course, we are studying the verses of the Bible. um, But we're trying to study them, sort of back engineer them from words that we find interesting, phrases that we have interpreted and inferred in ways that perhaps, uh, well, I want to look at again for myself. And heaven and hell are the first ones. And so this word heaven. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. It's number 3772, G for Greek, 3772. The word is, okay, I'm going to have to go to my other place here to pronounce it properly. I've got this open on two screens so I can jump back and forth. 3772 is Uranos, Uranos. And in the English equivalent here, it's described as Heaven, air, sky, heavenly. So isn't that interesting? A throne was set in Uranus. Heaven, air, sky. Uh, No mention of a dimension here, so let's go to that word. Let's see what it means. Uranus. Root word, perhaps from the same as 3735 through the idea of elevation, the sky. Again, it, I looked that one up, and it has to do with the expanse, the expansion of everything beyond the earth into the sky above and, and, and beyond. And so this is the, they're saying that's the root of this word, Uranus. It occurs in the King James Version as heaven 268 times. So this is your word, people, that you're reading most of the time. It occurs, though, as air 10 times. So it... it It can't really be seen so much to describe some other dimension, it it wouldn't seem, if the same word can be used as air and sky five times and heavenly 1,537 times as heavenly. Uh, uh, So now, outline of biblical usage. One, the vaulted expanse of the sky with all things visible in it, which A means the universe, the world, B, the aerial heavens or sky, the region where the clouds and the tempests gather and where thunder and lightning are produced. C, the sidereal or starry heavens. So, so one, the meaning is clear. It's, it's everything from the earth out to those heavens. Now, two, in outline of biblical usage, says the region above the sidereal heavens, the seat of order of things eternal and consummately perfect, where God dwells and other heavenly beings. Okay, so now here's where we get to our common meaning of it. But you see, this is over and beyond the first general meaning of it. So where do we get that? This, I believe, becomes a little bit interesting. Strong's definition, Uranus, perhaps from the same as 3735, through the idea of elevation, the sky, by extension, Heaven, as the abode of God, see, by extension. By implication, happiness, power, eternity. Especially the gospel, Christianity. See, by implication and by extension. This is what I'm trying to get to. By implication and by extension. Now, Thayer's Greek lexicon. Now, this is a little harder to to go through because it's all um, using the Hebrew and Greek words here, but, but they they go through this explanation in depth that the root meaning to cover, to encompass. So that's where we get this idea. And and I don't know if if reading all of this is what everybody wants me to do right now. So I'll just 
I'll try and summarize it. That what they're uh, well, I'll, I'll grab a couple piece, pieces out of it. The ancients conceived of the expanded sky as an arch or vault, the outmost edge of which touched the extreme limits of the earth. Okay, this this firmament. So in these ancient texts, and and they 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 cite all these texts from Genesis to to the New Testament to Revelation, in which it, its primary meaning has to do with the universe or the arch that that is over the earth. Okay. Now when we get to the idea of this, um, okay. I'll just read you little parts that maybe you want to study it yourself. But the heavens are also likened in poetic speech to an expanded curtain or canopy in Psalms, in Isaiah, and to an unrolled scroll. Hence, and they, they give you the Hebrew and Greek words. So I don't obviously can't keep up with them there. Uh, Hebrew, Revelation. The aerial heavens or sky, the region where the clouds and tempests gather and where thunder and lightning are produced. Okay, this is where that part comes from. Uh, this is this poetic reference. Now they quote a whole bunch of passages and many um, Greek and Hebrew words. And they say these heavens are opened by being cleft asunder and from the upper heavens or abode of heavenly beings come down upon the earth. Now the Holy Spirit and now in vision appeared to human sight some of the things within the highest heaven as in Acts. Through the aerial heavens sound voices which are uttered in the heavenly abode. Uh, the side reel or starry heavens. Uh, of the powers. Okay, again, I, I'm grabbing from this very long document here, which is citing all of the different scriptures and the original words in Greek and Hebrew in which these particular words occur and then trying to give us a closer version in English as to what they mean for us. Okay, so... That's why this is kind of an important part of what we're doing in this first week of looking at heaven before we just start reading all the verses in which it pertains, okay? Because it does actually mean this one version, which occurs quite a bit in the New Testament, means everything from the, the air, literally, the sky, literally, where the clouds are, to something more poetic, as something where the you know, the unseen area that you can still imagine extending from the sky. And then now I'm trying to get to the part where they talk about something of uh, this, this consummately perfect, okay? So here it says, the region above, this, this, is, this is the part they quoted earlier, but, but I'm, I'm hoping maybe we can find a little bit more verification here. The region above the sidereal heaven, the seat of an order of things eternal and consummatedly perfect, where God dwells and the other heavenly beings. This heaven, Paul, in Second Colossians, or Corinthians, I think it's Corinthians here, in Second Corinthians, seems to, be, seems to designate by the name of, and he, they, they give this Greek word, but certainly not the third of the seven district heavens described by the author of the testimony, the patriarch Leviticus, and by the rabbins. Okay, see, so they get into a lot of documentation here. Um, several distinct heavens are spoken of also in Ephesians. Again, they quote the Greek words that they're citing. Hebrews, if it be not preferable here to understand the numerous regions or parts of the one and the same heaven where God dwells as referred to. The highest heaven is the dwelling place of God. What I'm trying to get, or what, what struck me in this, um, is that it has this feeling 
of very much like Hades has of of being a a place of multiple dwelling dwellings or levels or I mean which goes to our dimensional understanding of heaven but I'm trying to extract from from our minds that it it's really better seen in a material expression of a hierarchy right now in what they're presenting to us in the way of Hades rather than this eternal dwelling we haven't reached anything yet really um, except that uh, that it has this feel preferable here to understand the numerous regions or parts of one and the same where God dwells the highest heaven is as God's dwelling place um, the seat of an order of things eternal See, this is, this is where the region above the sidereal heavens. See, this is implied by all this, but there's nothing delineated. It's implied that there exists such a place. But what I'm trying to get at is where is it, where is it where we get this confidence that this is where we are going to dwell? I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying it's time we discern. Because already we saw this throne that's set in heaven. It's this same word that has to be delineated for what are we talking about here? Why do we think we have such a clear picture of this place where God lives? See, a lot of these are things spoken of. These are Greek words used by the New Testament writers to infer this heaven is the abode to which Christ ascended after his resurrection and from which he will hereafter return into heaven have already been received the souls both of the old testament saints and of departed christians according to hebrews and heaven is appointed as the future abode of those who raised from the dead which we know is hades and clothed with superior bodies shall become partakers of the heavenly kingdom and enjoy the reward of proved virtue. Hence, eternal blessings are called, he quotes the Greek word, on those on whom God has conferred eternal salvation. Uh, or the salvation awaiting them is said to be laid up for them in heaven. Okay, now this is where I think the point of, well, for me, what, it, what I, the, the little light bulb, that went on for me, okay, is that consider that now, that uh, definition of heaven as this place where Christ went, where he'll come from, where, where God lives, where eternal beings are, where we're destined to have our, our salvation is awaiting to be laid up for us in heaven. And don't forget this part right here. Um who raised from the dead and closed with superior bodies. That's where we know where Paul talks about the, the corrupted bodies putting on incorruptibility shall become partakers of the heavenly kingdom. See, the heavenly kingdom. See, which makes you imagine this place, this abode that we'll be in that nobody else will be in. But, but okay, so wait a minute now. That might be accurate. Or it might be there might be another consideration here. Let's look at this first word listed under the Greek words for heaven. Because well, let's first look at their English equivalent so we know which one to check. We've got um, the one we just looked at was G three seven seven two Uranos heaven air sky, and the root of heavenly, which occurs fifteen hundred plus times. Then you've got three seven seven one. Uranothen, from heaven, from this heaven, air, sky. So these words are intimately connected. One descends from the other. 3771, Uranothen, is from heaven, being Uranos, heaven, air, sky. So that's those two. Then you've got G3321, uh, mesurenema, mesurenema, me, mesurenema, and that 
English equivalent is midst of heaven. Midst of heaven. Now, I, let's look at it real quick because I, I didn't look at I just assumed that one means sort of in the sky from a presumed compound of 3319 and 3772, which we 3772 we saw was the heaven that we're talking about, this sky. Outline of biblical usage is mid heaven one or two, the highest point in the heavens, which the sun occupies at noon, where what is done can be seen and heard by all. Uh, Strong's definition from a presumed compound of these two words, G3319 and G3772, mid-sky, midst of heaven. It occurs only three times in the Greek. So, uh, and it's in Revelation, so it is a very interesting um, word then. Number 3321, and beheld I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. Right, that's odd. An angel flying through the midst of heaven, what, the sky? Unlikely. Revelation 14, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. See, because he's in his vision. He's in a dream state. So what heaven is this? Is it is he seeing planets and skies? You know, what does he mean when he's saying heaven? Let's look at this one and just see for a moment. Heaven, this is three three two one, which is uh this heaven that we're in that's midst of heaven. And that heaven is assumed to be taken from the, the heaven that we've just been talking about, which has sort of a uh, a, a relationship of meanings, if you will. Everything from air and sky all the way to the, the particular air and sky shared by the eternal beings. Okay, This 3319 means midst 41 times, among six times, from among um, five times, midnight two times, and miscellaneous five times. This midst, in the, in the midst of heaven. The, as they say, it's a combination of words. It's assumed to be a combination of these two words. This mesos, which is what I'm looking at right now, in the midst, middle, the midst, in the midst of, or amongst, um, that combined with the word we've been discussing. It's the same word. This is, what I'm, this is all I'm trying to get through today, is that there's only so many words, and for the most part, the ones that we're studying um, here, right? We're, there's only a couple that even infer what, what we're getting at, right? We looked at the Hebrew word, um, which for the most part we can see implies the unseen world of the heaven above them. Nothing about another dimension at all. And now in the New Testament, this Uranus implies perhaps this realm of eternal beings, but what's that mean? There's no definition there beside the same air, have, same word. So, the, so that you're choosing that word, right? Okay, so that was G... 3 G3321 three, three, now you have G2032 Epiraneos Epiraneos sorry Ep, Epiraneos Epiraneos heavenly celestial in heaven high so this is pretty clearly talking about celestial bodies and high you know this has got nothing to do with abode whatsoever so now this is the word i wanted to get to Basilea, Basilea, G932. And Basilea is uh, English equivalent, says kingdom. Uh, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom in general or even of evil. Thy or thine kingdom, his kingdom, the kingdom, my kingdom. Right? So, Basilea. Say, but Basileia, Basileia. So where does, where are they talking about kingdom? 
uh, of God 71 times, of heaven 32 times, in general or of evil 20 times, thy or thine kingdom six times, his kingdom six times, the kingdom five times, my kingdom four times, and miscellaneous 18 times. Outline of biblical usage, royal power, kingship, dominion, rule, A, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. B, of the royal power of Jesus as the triumphant Messiah. C, of the royal power and dignity conferred on Christians in the Messiah's kingdom. This is biblical usage, remember. This doesn't necessarily mean what, what the Greeks or Hebrews used it as. This is the way it's used in the Bible. Two, a kingdom, the territory subject to the rule of a king. And three, used in the New Testament to refer to the reign of the Messiah. Okay, Strong's definition. Basilia. Basilea. Basilea. From uh, G935, properly, royalty. Uh, example, abstractly rule or concretely a realm, literally or figuratively. Um, so again, this is this to me is where we start to get close to this dimensional idea. So that when heaven is used in conjunction with this, or or this is used as the the kingdom of God rather than the word heaven, it seems like this confers a little more of that idea. Um, of another dimension, right? Matthew, and saying, Repent ye for the kingdom, this word, G932, of heaven is at hand. Again, the devil taketh him up into the exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So see, same word, so kingdom. So this word means authority, rule, right? Not, not a place, but a rulership, a kingdom, okay? And it says here it's referred to of the millennial kingdom. Now, I know I'm getting out of time today, so uh, I, won't, um, I won't take this quite as far as I was thinking. But what I really wanted to, what I, I guess where I want to drop the hint, I've gone here to, to Revelations. Revelation 16, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Same word, kingdom, right? So when it says kingdom, you have to you know whose kingdom? Kingdom of God, kingdom of, you know, his kingdom, the beast kingdom, right? Revelation 17, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom. So see, the, again, this is power, authority to rule, not necessarily the the physical um, apparition of it, right? The the flags and the and the gates and the walls and the halls. This is the actual authority to rule. That's what this word means. Is what I want to get at. Okay, Revelation seventeen seventeen. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. Again, it's this kingdom. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And that's one of these miscellaneous places it's used. That word, which reigneth. Reigneth is one of those. That's the same word. Basileia. Basileia. So, the woman which reigneth. Saw, uh, and the woman which thou saw is the great city which, again, has this rulership. It's a rulership. So, the kingdom doesn't have to be a, a place. All right, and so this is where I'd like to draw the conclusion for today to set the tone for next week. Is that what I think we need to start looking for? You know, I, I seem to recall that uh, to answer what I said at the beginning that how do I know or why am I saying we're not going to go to a place but a kingdom, see, a rulership? Because in the final expression of all this, and, and I'll drop the the interesting notation for those that are over, you know, going to my other YouTube sites at Think or Swim is where Sheikh Im Imran Hossein is, or U U Dystopia, where some of the other political stuff is. But, but over at Think or Swim at YouTube, 
is a channel that's got many of the videos that I like so much, the studies from Sheikh Imran Hossein. And it turns out the Quran also sees a new heaven, you know, God making it new again, to start over again. And our Bible in Revelation shows, you know, God raising Hades and throwing it all into this lake of fire, which again, we haven't done the study. What is, what, what, that's not the Valley of Hinnon. That's something else. And he wipes away all the tears and there'll be no more sadness or grief. Okay, everything changes, including the relationship of God to his creation. And it's at that time that it's, it's not until that time. It's not until after that happens that the new Jerusalem descends again out of heaven, out of the sky, even the endless sky, even the eternal place where these eternal beings are, whatever that means. We don't go there. It comes to the new earth and the new heaven. And that new heaven, again, if you look at that word, what is it? It's, an, it's a new sky, a new expanse, right? Not a new eternal kingdom. See, that's why all the places that it's mentioned now, when, when we look at that word, bas Basilia, and all the places it's mentioned, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is coming. See, is coming. Um, the Son of Man shall send forth His angels, Matthew said, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. See? Right? Gather forth out of His rule, His place, his heaven, right? His kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. See? So, I just want to start this by what I've found is just this, this supposition that ultimately, God's new Jerusalem is not heaven. That's new Jerusalem. That's God's physical place if you want to talk about a physical apparatus. Right? Right? That comes to the new earth that he makes. We, the new earth doesn't go to some realm called heaven. right? So taking Christians to heaven simply means being wherever the Spirit of God is. And that seems very close now. I, I'm, I'm just feeling like I'm getting very close now to seeing across the expanse like the rich man did over to where Abraham's bosom was. Because Jesus said, you'll be in paradise today with me. Right? Because all of that is in heaven, in a sense. Hades, then, might be considered to be in heaven, uh, although that's probably a terrible construction of the word. It would be probably much better to say Hades is in creation heaven is part of creation see they're they're not it's not the place uh, separate from a separate creation I guess is the way I'm, I'm stumbling this out in my view heaven's not this separate place it's all part of this place it's the place where the people who who God chose to be His servants, they reside there in that highest heaven. I mean, it's interesting that it's put that way, isn't it? When we know that the word heaven that's used all, all those times is also the word that's used for air and sky and, and primarily, you know, the, the expanse. The, it's, the, it's that Greek word that they used for that arch over, the, over what they saw that they knew was, you know, there. It's there. We see the sky above us, but then we see the, the sky above the sky, the heaven. And so, so this place doesn't appear to be this place of permanent abode for these bodies that are going to be resurrected, is what I'm saying, because that comes here, right? They see the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven. Jesus returns from heaven with his holy ones, right? Where does it say we, our destiny is this heaven, 
right? Our destiny is the kingdom of heaven, okay? And that seems to be something quite different. So, anyway, I, ho I hope uh, the few people that are sticking with the Bible study are enjoying this. I, I really feel that this is a wonderful resource, and I'm happy to... Um, um, to get into any kind of discussion because I know that, you know, we're, I'm not just interpreting scripture so much as trying to, uh, find my way through scripture. And I'm trying to open the questions for others. I, I have some pretty good ideas because I've been studying for an awful long time, but, you know, I don't know these answers. I just feel more and more secure that the believe in Jesus go to hell, you know, what is hell, this place you burn forever. Well, wait a minute, that, you know, not even the words support that. And so likewise, believe in Jesus, you know, go to heaven. <laughs> or, or don't believe in Jesus, go to hell. Believe in Jesus, go to heaven. Well, okay. Well, so where is that? You know, what are you promising me? What are you saying? Where am I going? And And it appears to be the promise is, being part of the kingdom of heaven. You're in his kingdom. You're under his authority. You're putting yourself under his authority. And that authority we've already seen is one of self-sacrifice, is one of doing for your neighbor, is, you know, is not one that seems to be measured by temporal security and temporal um, ego satisfaction and temporal you know, money, gold and silver, comforts. You know, those, those things never, were, you know, those seem to be the things that put you at the highest risk of, of being separated from God. So, you know, that's the hard truth about Christianity, just like all the religions. I did a little short, and it, I didn't quite get to say all the things I really have in my mind to say, and I, I know it needs to be edited and updated another day, but the thing about religions in 2015, uh, the deeper point of that was, you know, to try and say that all of our highest ideals, you know, sort of center around the same concept of selflessness, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, the Hebraic tradition in its beginning. I mean, love your neighbor as yourself comes out of Genesis. I'll put their heart, I'll put my laws in their hearts comes out of Genesis. So, you know, and, and then and then most of the other stuff that is considered uh, the weighty uh, concepts, you know, are things that came out of David. And the Psalms in that era, thousand years before Christ, old Hebraic tradition, you know, Moses and David. You don't have to go any farther than that to find out what God was really trying to express through these people. And it is this commitment to selflessness, right? They couldn't loan money on interest. They had to forgive all debts every seven years. They had to give all land transactions back every 50th year. You know, so there was no building up monopolies. There was no building up tyrannies, right? It, it, it just ensured that all people would remain relatively equal within their own um, um, motivation to get ahead, right? You could build what you wanted for yourself, but you couldn't really ruin anybody else to get more for yourself because they're lazy or whatever. They're willing to to be taken. They're willing to be beaten. They're willing to be... Sold, you know, sold something that sounds good today, and now you've taken their land forever. Well, back then in the law of the Hebrews, you, you know that was in the law. You couldn't do that. You see how why they got rid of that law so quickly. I mean, you know, they got rid of the whole heart of it, and why God accused them all through the Old Testament. You know, you you pretend to obey the 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 ordinances, but your heart is not in it. Okay, so I look at religion as being this call to the higher thing that we all know, but none of us can really do, because what's the real carrot for being selfless? What's the real reward for, you know, giving all our money to the poor and being like St. Francis of Assisi, another beggar? How do you smile and be as happy and sing like St. Francis being a beggar, Right. But that is the, you know, that's what the secret of Christianity and of all religions tries to enlighten humanity. You know, and we've obviously gone the other way into secularism and every other answer, make myself happy, is, is the other answer, materialism. 
and you know look what look where it's gotten us so you know this is the deeper reason to pay a little attention to the idea and, and then and then when you you know i don't know the old hindu way is you know demands that you have to commit the time you got to study the scriptures you got to meditate or or you'll be stuck in this world and so it's hard for me to see that anybody's going to break out of this you know uh, fortunately for the Christian, and in my view anyway, the, the metaphysic of love is that every minute, you know, it's it's a moment by moment thing uh, between a, a human consciousness and God. It's a moment by moment thing, and that's why it could say in the scriptures in John there we read, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, perhaps it was in Romans and through Paul that if the Jews uh, and now I'm thinking it's in the Old Testament in Micah or something, so forgive me, but the, but I have my, my idea straight. That if anyone, uh, you know, it, your righteousness from yesterday won't be remembered if you work iniquity tomorrow, and your iniquity from yesterday won't be remembered if you turn to righteousness tomorrow. You know, so that's in there. You can't earn it once. You know, and that's one of the fallacies that some people have been able to point out with the, the Christianity that wants to swing on this, you know, believe in Jesus and now we're going to heaven and nothing you can do. But apparently, many come in that day and say, did we not do all these things in His name? So apparently His name isn't the only credential. Anyone who calls on that name in the great and dreadful day of the Lord will be saved. So separate when that is. Thousands of years later, after we've all been in the grave, after it's all been made quite clear, anyone in that day that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's that's kind of how easy I see it is to stay out of the lake of fire. Christians can't stand that. Oh, you mean you could deny Jesus all your life? You could be an atheist, and then you could just at the end say Jesus and be saved? Well, yeah, that's apparently what God's saying. I don't know. His mercy apparently is more reasonable than Christian mercy. But again, for me, the safest money is love your neighbor. You know, be on that side of God. Be loving your neighbor. Be be the one who's not worshiping mammon when he comes. I mean, that's not easy to do. I say that all of us are in a in a predicament where mammon is our God, and you know, we don't just get to pretend that it's so easy because we say, Oh, Jesus saves. Well, yeah, he certainly does. But does that mean we're following him? No, I think most of us are still worshiping mammon because we can't even help it. You know, it's like getting a bank account. You can't not do that and live in the world. I mean, you can, but boy, you look how hard it's going to make it on you. Well, if you think, if you think saying no to a bank account is going to make it on you, try saying yes to being a follower of Jesus, right? And, and then tell me what you know, what strong Christians we are, because. We're able to what? Chant his name 24 hours a day till the rest of the world is sick of it because they see us chanting his name and acting like everybody else, worried about their bank account, worried about their job, worried about their, you know, getting one up on their neighbor. And then we're, but we're the ones screaming Jesus. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, for me, this is what's, this is the only point of this Bible study is to, realize to encourage us all that the real Christianity is on the side of people like St. Francis. You know, the real Christianity is on the side of the first church who, you know, so laid everything at the apostles' feet, claimed nothing for their own, made sure there was no needy among them. You know, you know, you can't go wrong if that's in your heart, if that's what you're doing. The, the real trick is how do you get that in your heart? And so I say for me, part of the help has been realizing that not everybody's going to hell. We're all in the same boat together. We're all going to Hades for our sins. We Christians who might merit through our faith, nothing else but our faith, but do we have faith? You know, that's, that's where I'm, you know, is just saying Jesus saves, is that faith? Or is that just the, you know, is that the beginning to faith? Is faith not a word that means an action? based on belief? I mean, what is the action then? Just saying it? Is that enough? Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And just by saying it, that's sufficient faith? Maybe it is, but 
I don't think it's the kind of faith that's going to bring the rapture. That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's the kind of faith that's going to miss the rapture and be part of the servants that are left here to help the world get through the the death that's coming to everybody so we can die with a little dignity and there can be plenty of us Christians around to keep telling that, hey, don't, you know, come to Jesus now kind of thing, you know, rely on Jesus. The world is bad, the radiation is getting us, the whatever, but there is that other side that's coming, right? There is another resurrection coming. So get in on that. Uh, I think that's going to be, you know, most of Christianity's job for seven years. Um, that's what spitting out of the mouth of Jesus will get us if we're part of that Laodicean church. And, you know, I, I keep saying us because I keep praying that I make it. I don't know. I don't know. Why should I? I don't, I don't give everything to the poor. I, I don't do anything but rely on the gift. And I don't, re, I don't recall him saying he's holding the door open for those people. I, I recall him saying, I'm holding the door open for you Philadelphian church who have not denied my name. You know, meaning you're, you're still towing the line. You're still doing for others as you do for yourself. I mean, that's the way I read it. So am I doing that? Ooh, I don't know. I'm pretty selfish. I still, you know, I might, I, I might, I might want to do for others. I might try to do the little bit that I can drag myself away from all my selfish time. But yeah, am I am I secure in that? That I do for others? Am I secure that I treat my fellow man as well as I treat myself? No, actually, I'm very insecure in that. I already, you know, and so what does that mean? What's Jesus going to do about me? You know, take me to heaven and kill everybody else in hell. <laughs> wow, I couldn't even live with a Jesus that felt that way about me. So, yeah, you know, this is this is why I try and encourage myself along with the people who listen to, you know, find it in yourself to cut loose with that money. Not, not just for, you know, the ministry, which, which, you know, you, you really, if you, if you read your scripture, you're supposed to feed the people that are bringing you the, the word. And I realize we don't have a big crowd, and so that's why we don't have a, a lot of people given to us. But it's nice that those that do pr help provide so that those that don't, you know, that's the whole point of the storehouse, that there'd always be meat for God's people. So, you know, I'm happy to do it. It's my, you know, that's my joy. I, it, it's your joy is what I'm pointing out. I'm trying to give the encouragement. Find your own joy to give. You know, give a little bit to the ministry. Give a lot to your neighbor. You know, give even more to the poor. And if there's anything left, you know, make sure there's no needy <laughs> among you. And, and you know, you'll be doing... You know, then you don't have to... I don't think you have to be concerned about anything at all. You, you really you can feel confident that whatever that highest heaven is, you're going to get to see it. You're going to get to see it. You know, I don't know everybody's going to get to see that. I don't know I'm going to get to see that. I'm, you know, I tell you, I'm struggling for that place of salvation. Please, Lord, don't, don't, don't forget me when you get to your kingdom. I don't deserve anything. I'm hanging on a cross for my sins. But please, don't forget me when you get to your kingdom. So... Anyway, thanks, you guys.